Hey everyone, uh, thanks for joining my talk. Um, I'm happy to be here with great other folks that share the knowledge with, uh, with others. Our talk today is how do we utilize chaos engineering to become better cloud native engineers? Let me first introduce myself. My name is Iran and I'm leading the Cyanobook Security Engineering at Siren. I'm an engineer, I'm a problem solver uh, and love sharing my knowledge with others, obviously. So before we start, I would like to start with this one. What are you going to gain out of this talk? I would like to share with you how we leverage chaos engineering principles uh, to achieve other things besides its main goal. We wanted at the beginning to bring more confidence to our engineers while responding to production incidents. And in addition to that, train them to become better cloud native engineers as it requires additional expertise, which isn't just uh, the actual programming job or and ship your code to somewhere. I would like to share with you how we got there, what we are doing, and how it improves our engineering team's expertise. And you might ask yourself, why is this title on Colake King? So it's a series of workshops I composed in Siren, uh, which are at the beginning, I must admit, uh, meant to bring more confidence to the to the engineers during uh, their own call shifts. But later on, it became a great playground uh, to train the cloud native engineering practices uh, and share knowledge around that. So during this session, I'm going to share what we are doing in such workshops. So stay with me to learn more. So let's start with the buzzword cloud native. Here's the definition I copied uh, from the CNCF documentation which they call it the cloud native definition. I have highlighted some of the words there. Um, while, you, while you read the definition, you see the words uh, scalable, dynamic, loosely coupled, resilient, manageable, observable. At the end, you see something that I truly believe in and I'm trying to make, uh, to make it part of the culture of any engineering team I join. As engineers, we deliver products. Uh, from the definition, you see that this is what actually cloud native brings as a result. Engineers can make high impact changes. This is my opinion, what every engineer culture should believe in. Make an impact, as an as a result, you will have happy customers. The evolution of the cloud native uh, technologies and the need to scale engineering um, lead the organization to restructure the teams and embrace new architectural approaches such as microservices. We are using cloud environments that are pretty dynamic and we might choose building microservices to achieve better engineering scale. You should remember that as a side note, microservices are not the goal, but we use that, the cloud and other stuff as the tools to scale our engineering product. As your system scale, um, your system probably becomes more and more distributed. Distributed systems are by nature challenging. They are not easy to debug, they are not easy to maintain. And why it's not easy? Just because we ship pieces of a larger puzzle. Two years ago, I wrote a blog uh, that's trying to describe the engineering uh, evolution at a glance. I think that the role of engineers grown to be much bigger. We are not shipping code anymore. Um, we design it, we develop it, we release it. We support it in production. The days that we had to throw the artifacts, the artifacts um, uh, on operations are, are over. As engineers, we are accountable for the full relief cycle. If you think about it, it's mind blowing. We brought so much power to us as engineers and with regret power, we should be much more responsible. You might be interested in uh, reading my post uh, that, I, that I wrote uh, two years ago. 
I just talked about the changes and the complexity, but we should embrace it, just these changes. These changes enable teams to take an end-to-end -end ownership of their deliveries and enhance their velocity. As a result of these evolutions, engineers these days are closer to the product and the customer needs. In my opinion, there's still a long way to go and companies are still struggling how to get engineers closer to their customers to understand in depth what their business impact. We talked about impact, but what is this engineer impact that we talk about? Engineers need to know what do they solve, what their influence on the customer and know the impact on the product. If you think about it, there is a transition in the engineering mindset. We ship product and not just code. We embrace this transition, which brings with it so many benefits to the companies that are adapting them. And we are among, the, among us, among them. Um, and on the other end, uh, as a team and the system scale, it becomes challenging to write new features that solve a certain problem. And even understanding a service behavior is much more complex. And let's see why it becomes more complex. The advanced approaches that I just uh, mentioned uh, bring great value, but as engineers, we are now writing apps that are part of a wider collection of other services that are built on top of a certain platform in the cloud. I really like what Ben is sharing in his slides and I would like to share it with you. He's calling them deep systems. Images are better than words uh, and the pyramid in the slide explains it all. You can see that as your service scales, you need to be responsible to a deep chain of other services that these services actually depend on. This is what it means we are maintaining deep systems. Obviously, microservices and distributed systems are deep by nature. Let's try to imagine just a certain service you have. Let's say you have some, I don't know, order service. What do you do in this order service? You fetch the data in one service and then you need to fetch another data from another service and you maybe produce an event to a third service. The story can go on, but you understand the concept. It's just complex. Deep systems are complex and you should know how to deal with them. As part of transitioning into being more cloud native, distributed and relying on um, orchestrators such as Kubernetes at your foundations, engineers face more and more challenges that they didn't have to deal with before. Just imagine this scenario. You are on call. There is some back pressure that burning your SLO targets. There is some issue with one, your, with one of your ACs and third of your deployment couldn't reschedule due to some node availability issues. What do you do? You need to find it. You, you need to find it out. And you might need to point that to your on-call DevOps colleague. By the way, DevOps may be working on that already, as it might trigger the SLOs as well. These kind of incidents happen. And as a cloud native engineer, you should be aware of the platform you're running in. What does it mean? You should know that there are ACs in every region. Uh, your pod affinities are defined in some way and the pods that are scheduled have some status. There are cluster events, and how do you read the cluster events uh, in such a failure? This was just one particular scenario that happened to me and might happen to many of you before. As you see, it's not your just service anymore. It's more than that. And this is what it means to be a cloud native engineer. As I said already, being a cloud native engineer is fun, but also challenging. So these days, engineer are, engineers aren't just um, uh, writing code and building packages, but are expected to know how to write the relevant Kubernetes resource YAMLs or use Helm or containerize their app and ship it to some variety of environments. Um, so as you see, it's not enough to know it at a high level. Being a cloud native engineer means that it's not enough to just know the programming language you are working on well, but you should also keep adapting uh, your knowledge and understanding of the cloud native technology that you are depending on. Besides the tools you are using, 
Building cloud native applications involves taking into account many moving parts, such as the platform you are building on, the database you are using, and much more. Obviously, there are great tools and frameworks out there that abstract some of this complexity out from you as an engineer, but being blind to them might hurt you day or even night. If you haven't heard of the fallacies of distributed uh, commute, computing, uh, I really suggest you to read further on them. They are here to stay and you should be aware of them and be prepared. In cloud, things will happen, things will fail. Don't think that you know what to expect. Just, just make sure uh, you understand them, you handle them gracefully and embrace them. As I said, they will just happen. We talked a lot, a, a lot about um, uh, the great benefits and also the challenges. Uh, so this is what we had to do and we had to deal with them, with these challenges here at Siren. So let me explain what did we do to cope with these uh, challenges here. We utilized chaos engineering for that purpose and we have found this method pretty useful and I think that it can be nice to share with you the practices uh, that how we dealt with them here. Um, so stay here with me. Let's first give a quick brief of what chaos engineering in, is. The main goal of chaos engineering is as explained uh, in the slide that I just copied from the chaos principles uh, website. The idea of chaos engineering is to identify the weaknesses and reduce uncertainty when building distributed systems. As I already mentioned uh, in previous slides, building distributed systems at scale is challenging. And since such systems tend to be composed of many moving parts, leveraging chaos engineering practices to reduce the blast radius of such failures proved itself to, as a great um, uh, method uh, for that purpose. So I've created a series of workshops called On Colloquia King. These workshops intend to achieve two main objectives. The first, train engineers on production failures that we had recently. And the second is to train engineers on cloud native practices, tooling, and how to become better cloud native engineers. A bit on our on-call procedure before we proceed, so it will help you to understand better what, I talking, what, I'm talking, what I'm going to talk about in the next slides. We have weekly engineering shifts and a, and, and a NOC team that monitors our system 24-7. There are three alert severities defined, severity one, two, and three, which actually define the business impact alerts to the actual service owner alerts that we usually monitor. We have alert playbooks that assist uh, the on-call engineer while uh, responding to an event. Uh, I will elaborate on, on them a bit later. And in case of a severity one, the first priority is to get the system back to a normal state. The on-call engineer that is leading the incident should understand the high-level business impact uh, to communicate uh, back to the, to the customers. And in any case, that there needs to be some specific expertise uh, to bring back the, into a functional state, the engineer is making sure that the relevant team or the service owner are on the keyboard to lead it. These are the tools that the engineer got uh, in his box uh, to utilize in case of an incident. It's a pretty nice tool that I must admit. Um, we have Jaeger, Kibana, Grafana, and all, the, and, all the, and all the rest. Now that we understand the big picture, let's read down in, uh, to the workshop itself. The workshop, ses the workshop uh, sessions are composed into three parts. We have the introduction and a goal setting. Uh, then we might share some important stuff that we would like to share with everyone. And uh, then we start the challenge uh, as the most important thing of this workshop. Let's dive into each one of the one of the parts that I just mentioned above. The session starts with a quick introduction and motivation. Why do we have this session? What are we going to do in the upcoming session? And make sure that the audience are, are aligned um, on the flow and the agenda. It's very important to show that every time, as it makes people more connected uh, to the motivation and understand what is going to happen. 
This is part of your main goal. You should try to keep people focused and concentrated, so make sure that the things are clear and concise at the beginning of every workshop session. Sometimes we utilize the session as a great opportunity to communicate some uh, architectural aspects, platform improvements, or process changes that we had recently. For example, we provide some updates on the on call process, uh, maybe core service flow that we had some uh, that we made some adaptations on, and and more. And the last part and the most important part is we work on maximum two production incidents uh, simulation, and the overall session shouldn't be longer than sixty minutes. We have found out that we lose engineers' concentration for longer sessions. So if you work hybrid, um, it is better that these sessions uh, will, will happen when you are in the same workspace, as we have found that much more productive. The communication is a key, and it's making lots of, uh, uh, making a great difference. Let me share with you what we are doing specifically uh, in this part, which is the core of this workshop. I think this is one of the most important things. Our Oncology King workshop sessions are usually trying to be close to real life production scenarios as possible, by simulating real production scenarios uh, in one of our environments. Such real life scenarios enable the engineers to build confidence while taking care of real production incident. Try to have an environment that you can simulate that incident on and let people play in real time. As we always say, there is no identical environment to production uh, and since we are doing specific experiments, it is necessary to have, uh, it's not really necessary to have a, a production environment in place. Obviously, as more as you advance, it might be better to work on production but it's much more co complex by nature as you as you already understand and we have never done this before since we utilize chaos engineering here i suggest uh, having a real experiment uh, that you can execute within a few clicks we're using one of our lotus environments for that purpose um, i must uh, must say that we started manually uh, so if you don't have a tool I really suggest you not to spend time on that. Don't rush to use a specific chaos engineering tool. Uh, just recently, we started using Lit Litmus Chaos uh, to run these uh, chaos exper experiments, uh, but you can use anything else you would like to, uh, or you can just simulate these incidents manually as we have done in the beginning. I think that the most important thing uh, is, as I said before, we need to have a playground for the engineers to actually exercise and not just hearing someone uh, talking about presentation slide in some demo. You will be convinced that when they are uh, practicing and not just listening to someone explaining, it makes the session very, very, very productive. Right after the introduction slides, we drill, we drill down into our first challenge. The session starts with, a with, a, with a, some slide that is explaining a certain uh, incident that we are going to simulate. We usually give some background of what is going to happen. For example, there is some back pressure in one of our services that we couldn't handle in some specific UTC time. We present some metrics of the current behavior. For example, uh, we present the alerts and the co corresponding uh, Grafana dashboards. Usually, um, uh, you sh I, I think that you should uh, present something that is very minimal uh, because this is how it usually happens during the real production incident. Then we give engineers some time to review the incident by themselves. Giving them time to think about it, it is really crucial. They are exercising alone, thinking if they have encountered something similar before. This is a very important step. It will encourage them to try and find out to find out more information and utilize their know-how to get more information, such as gather uh, some cluster metrics or view the relevant dashboards, read the logs or service status. And uh, I think that it's 
understanding the, the, the customer impact uh, is a very important uh, aspect. You should understand the customer impact. And even more importantly, uh, when you are an on, in, in, in an on-call shift. In case of a severity one, you should communicate the, the, the impact on the customer and see if there is any walk around that did the incident resolved completely. Engineer is not always aware of the actual customer impact. And it's very good time to discuss it. This, I think that the, the, the work session, I, I, I really uh, think that it's a good time to, to speak about such things. Um, I think that you should also pause their analysis from time to time and encourage them to ask questions. We have found out that the discussions around the incident is a great place for knowledge sharing. Knowledge sharing can be anything from design diagram to some specific Kubernetes command line. And if you are sitting together in the same space, it can be pretty nice because you can see who is doing what, and then you can ask them to show the tools that they are using, uh, and, and, and other people can learn a lot from that. What are they, what I really like in, in this session is that it triggers conversations and, and, and engineers tell to each other, uh, to send their, uh, to sell that, for example, to send them a CLI or tools that they recommend to use. It's pretty nice. Uh, and it really makes um, uh, the engineer's uh, life while debugging an incident much, much, much easier. The workshop sessions uh, will teach you a lot on the know-how that people have and I encourage you to update the playbooks based on that. If you don't have such a playbook, um, I really recommend you to have such. We have a variety of an incident uh, playbooks. Uh, most, of, most, of, most of them are uh, composed uh, for major severity one alerts. Uh, they provide on call engineer with some gotchas and high level flows that is important to know uh, and to look at when dealing with uh, different production incidents or scenarios. And this is how our this is how our our playbook uh, template uh, looks like. Uh, you can see that there is some description how to detect uh, the, the the issue, uh, how to assess the customer impact, and how to communicate uh, in case of a failure. Drive the conversations by asking questions that will enable you to share some of the topics that you would like to train on. <clears throat> a few examples that I have proved to be efficient are um, you can, for example, ask an engineer to present the Grafana dashboard to look at or ask someone else to share the Kibana logging queries or ask an hour, another one to present the, the Jaeger tracing and how, do the, and how do they find the trace. It's pretty nice, I, I must admit. Um, you sometimes need to moderate the conversation as as the time really flies fast uh, and you need to bring back uh, the focus of it because the conversation getting uh, uh, very heavy sometimes. During the discussion, point your figure on, inter on interesting architectural aspects that you would like uh, the engineers to know about. Maybe you can uh, talk on specific async channel that you might want to share your thoughts about or anything else. Encourage the audience to speak by asking questions around these areas of interest that will enable them to even suggest new design approaches or highlight uh, different challenges that they were thinking about lately. Uh, you might be surprised, um, I tell you, you might be surprised what people say and sometimes you might even add them some of the things that they suggest to your technical depth in order to take care of them later on. At the end of every challenge, ask somebody to present their end-to-end -end analysis. It makes things clear uh, for people that might that might not feel um, you know comfortable enough to ask questions in, uh, for example, in large forums or engineers that have been just joined the team or junior engineers that might want to learn more afterwards. Uh, it's a great source for people to get back into what has been done and also a fantastic part of your knowledge base. Uh, where you can share the onboarding uh, training process to new engineers that just uh, joined the team. I found out that 
people sometimes just watch the recording afterwards uh, and becomes handy even just for engineers to get some overview of the, of the tools that they that they have so just make sure to record it and share the meeting notes uh, right after the session as you have seen chaos engineering for training is pretty cool um, so leverage that to invest in your engineering team's knowledge and expertise and it seems like it was successful for us and maybe successful for you as well. So to summarize some of the key takeaways, we found out that these sessions are an awesome play playground for engineers. I must admit that I didn't think about using Chaos Engineering for this um, simulation at the first place. We started with just manual simulations of our incidents uh, or just presenting some of the evidence we gathered during some time of failure uh, to drive conversation around them. As we move forward, we leverage the usage of chaos tools for that purpose. Besides the training uh, to become better cloud native engineer, the on-core engineers are feeling more comfortable now in their shifts and understand the tools that are available to them to respond quickly. I thought it can be good to share, uh, as we always talk about chaos engineering experiments to make better reliable systems, but you can also leverage them uh, also to invest in your engineering team's uh, training. So thanks for your time and hope it was a fruitful uh, session. Uh, feel free to ask questions anytime and I will be very happy to share with you much more if you want to.